The concave bowl is one of those unique works that becomes not only pivotal in your practice, but continues to expand your, your thoughts about it. It was the first product I had manufactured by a company, and it was a very fortunate experience to have that be Alessi in Italy. It came about because Alessi ran a competition and my name had been recommended by their Japanese agent who had seen my work in a show in Tokyo. And the brief was very simple. It was for a memory object and you were given four typologies to work with and the bowl was one of them. At the time I was working on tableware and I had a Australian meat safe in my house and I was keeping my vegetables in it and it had perforated metal sides and I loved the way in the afternoon where the sun hit the, the meat, the perforated sides and the moray pattern that happened. So I decided to make a fruit bowl using perforated material that would allow the fruit to air. And I had made a prototype already playing with aluminium mesh and the moray pattern and colour and, and I thought, well, this, this is my memory. This is my geographical memory. This is something that's very Australian. It was taken up by Alessi. And I went to the factory and it was, re it was really interesting because they were curious about this chick from the other side of the world who made this work and that I'd made the prototype myself and resolved a lot of the design problems in the prototype. It was fascinating seeing the factory because Alessi actually worked in the same way as I did, except I only made up to 100 and they made thousands, but it was the same process. It was just magic to dr drop into this uh, tradition. It was just this wonderful opportunity to be someone working from Australia, to take my work and have it manufactured there. That opened this door that was really, really interesting to go from your handmade in your studio to manufacture and how you could keep the integrity of the object. I think it's a surprise to both Alessi and I that it's become one of their classics. I didn't want it to be over at the time $250. And a lot of Alessi's products were much, much more expensive because I, I wanted it to be accessible. The Mama store in New York was telling me how it was their best seller. And you go, why? And they said, well, people really like the idea and they can afford it. Maybe that's a, something about Iconic too. Cult objects grow out of manufacture. It has an accessibility as well and it starts to be an in-group identifier. They had tried to engage uh, silversmiths and craftspeople in their production. It was time where design was a dirty word in craft. Then they had thought about it further and approached the architects. And that's where the tea services came from. I've had two products end up in production. They were quite different experiences. The concave was in the early 90s and it was by fax machine and drawing. And they took me over to Alessi. I had to go over there. I went there twice. The second product is a condom box and that came out of being picked up because we'd eventually lured Alberto Alessi to Australia. He doesn't like to travel long distance but he was too intrigued with what was going on in this country and he came to Melbourne and he disappeared for an afternoon into my workshop and he was in heaven, you could see. He was just looking at all the tooling and all the making. And I had recently completed this condom box. And he asked me whether I would mind if Alessi manufactured it as well. 
four years later <laughs> because it had brought up a whole lot of different issues. But a condom box, Italy, Catholic company, is this something that Alessi should be producing? When they uh, sent the drawing through to me to be approved, I noticed it was two millimetres bigger either side. So the box was quite a bit bigger. So I quietly said, um, so I don't quite understand. This is, this is quite a bit bigger than the original. And they said, uh, oh, condoms are bigger in Italy. I studied gold and silversmithing at RMIT in the late 70s. And this was quite an active period of change. It's where uh, there was a big um, push and shove between art and design. And gold and silversmithing was in fine art. And I always thought of craft sitting between the two and being able to embrace both art and craft. So I work on that, that divide. Before I did gold and silversmithing, I had um, worked in graphics and had been an apprentice to Gary Emery, who's this country's most rigorous typographer. It was a fantastic training. It gave me a broad cross-sectional understanding of design and art. And it uh, evolved into this passion of how you can bring them all together. Uh, I set up Workshop 3000 my final year of gold and silversmithing primarily because I knew I needed um, a workspace to work in and this was the rest of my life. And it was quite deliberate that it was Melbourne postcode. And we deliberately chose the CBD for the location. And that initial hub idea of it being this place where you could connect with other makers and other thinkers is its driving force. It was always in my head to make it work from Australia. And if I was going to stay here, how could I develop an international career from Melbourne? Takes longer, takes about 15 years longer. I was part of the contemporary jewellery movement. When I started gold and silversmithing, this movement was just kicking off and it's what led me into jewellery. It was a political movement that were advocating jewellery's preciousness being by its personal association over its intrinsic value. It was a time where economics was changing, design was just emerging, it was post-war and people couldn't afford precious stones and uh, metals. So this group of jewellers were thinking that trying to promote that you could make jewellery out of any material from any idea, any technology, and that it was about the idea, which is something I think is a core of design. I don't know what makes something iconic. Something that captures the imagination of many people. As a designer, as a maker, you always, you're searching for that little bit of magic but you can't, you can't design it. It happens and it's, it's, it blows you away when it does and you keep trying to chase that and if you're lucky it might happen once or twice in your lifetime. My earrings have been uh, an extraordinary experience. I'd made the first pair because I wanted to wear them and again it was a design that was very simple it's a disc and some fittings. And they're in aluminium and they can be coloured any colour. So I'm, I can travel with a stack in my backpack and change them according to my mood. So it grew initially out of something that I wanted to wear. This was back in 1982. And people started to ask me for them. And I still make them today. I don't know how many thousands of them that I've made. And my greatest joy is when two people that I don't know, that don't know each other, have met through the earrings and become friends. 
And that's what jewellery is about. And that's what design is about. That is about creativity with connection with people. Uh, and I love it.